Welcome back to Tech Track. Our next speaker is Tobias Ospel, also known as Floyd. He's a long-term pen tester in Switzerland, but he's actually from Liechtenstein, a few people know. I only knew last year, surprise. Lately, he started his own company in Coor, where I come from, in Grisens. That is enough reason to have him on stage, but what is actually even more important is his work with Java fuzzing, which is really brand hot work, I think. And please welcome Toby Zospel on stage. So welcome everyone to my talk about uh, fuzzing Java code with the help of JQF. My name is Tobias Ospel, as we already said, and I'm also known as Floyd Online. So today I'm gonna talk about what is fuzzing in general, what's the idea, then we're gonna take a big leap forward and go into AFL already, a uh, very well-known fuzzer by now. And then we take another big leap and go over to Java fuzzing. So this will be um, a little bit fast-paced, but I hope uh, it will be easy enough to understand. So um, my co-founder, Martin Schobert, and me, we found a Pentagrid, and at Pentagrid, we hack things. So we do security analysis for companies and do pen tests. And Martin and me, we've been doing this for a decade already, and this is my main occupation. I'm also lecturing information security at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, and I'm also participating with the Cybersecurity Liechtenstein Association, where we prepare young people for the European Cybersecurity Challenge, which was just last week in Bucharest, and uh, we play CTF with the young people. So let's talk, talk about my topic today, uh, fuzzing. So what's fuzzing? It's the idea of feeding input into a program and do this in an automated way until we find undesired behavior. So actually any kind of undesired behavior um, can be found with fuzzers as long as you do the right instrumentation. So we call it instrumentation. Instrumentation is nothing else than being able to find what we're looking for and being able to know what our program is doing. So this is a very simple idea of fuzzing. And for C programs and programs in memory unsafe languages, this, this usually means uh, we're looking for simple crashes or memory corruptions. So any kind of bug crash is, uh, can be found by fuzzing nearly. I mean, not every kind, but a lot of different bugs can be found with fuzzing. So fast forward to AFL, American Fuzzy Lob, a very well-known fuzzer by now, and it does exactly what we just discussed. It takes an input, in this case, a file, and it puts it into the program, and because it has instrumentation, it will know um, what the program is doing and which code paths are taken. So it's very smart. So it has this feedback mechanism to know where is the program um, currently executing, what is it doing, and is it doing something new? So it's able to detect when the program is doing something new and basically prefers interesting input files which trigger new behavior. Now, at one point, hopefully, we find bugs. Now let's take this to a more real world example. So now we, we say, let's talk about libpng. So this is a program or a library to parse PNG image files, very, very common library. And we start with an input on the left side, which is uh, a, a picture of a rabbit. And what we do is we feed this, this picture into libpng and mutate it until um, different code paths are executed. So we want to know, or we want to make sure that a lot of code paths are executed, and in the end, hopefully, we are able to cover the entire program, libpng in this, in this case, and of course, at one point, hopefully as well find a bug. So the ability, again, to see which code is executed and if we find a bug, is instrumentation and allows us um, to do 
fuzzing rounds. So even more practice in practice, this is how AFL will look like. This is the UI of AFL. So we don't have time today to look into all of these parts. So let's just look at three major things. One is the total pass you see on the left side in blue. And it just means what kind of behavior we can trigger inside libpng in this case. And unique crashes just means that we were able with our instrumentation to find a bug, see a crash of libpng, and um, yeah, during our fuzzing run, the, the program crashed. And then there's a third thing, which is called unique hangs, which just means there was an input file and we gave it to libpng and it took too long to process, whatever that means. So that might mean that it would take like one millisecond more um, than AFL was configured to wait for libpng. But it might also mean that it would run for a very, very, very long time. So these can be interesting files as well. OK, this was a very short introduction into fuzzing and fuzzing memory corrupt for memory corruption bugs. And this is how it works. But now we have to take this big leap forward again, and we end up with Java. But fuzzing Java is actually nothing else. We, do, we have the same, uh, exactly the same ideas. And JQF AFL uses AFL, and it works the same way. So Java Image I.O., let's take this as an example as a target program we want to test. And Image I.O., just as libpng, is able to parse PNG image files. So it's in the st uh, standard library of Java, and we can test it. But the big question is really, what are these crashes now? Because, well, I hope you know that uh, Java is a memory-safe language, so we shouldn't uh, get memory corruption bugs, and Java shouldn't crash. So what does it mean when we get crashes for Java? So to see um, what crashes mean in this case, I want to do the JQF um, AFL tutorial with you, which is basically fuzzing um, the image IO library and the PNG parser. So let's start this video. We have a class file, which is just uh, saying, OK, we want to fuzz image IO, the PNG parser. And we have this class file, which has an annotation called add fuzz. We have this function that takes an input stream, and we just feed it into image IO and tell it to parse it as a PNG file. If an IO exception occurs, we don't really care, because image IO tells us, if you give me something invalid, I will just throw an IO exception. So this is our setup for the fuzzing run we want to do. All right, we can compile this program. And afterwards, we have a command line tool called JQF AFL Fuzz. And we can say, OK, please start running this Java program fuzzing. It will start up, and uh, of course, it will print a lot of information that is important, but not for us today. So we get this UI, and on the top right, you see the three things I, ex I just explained. So you see the total path uh, that we discovered. We find no crashes and no hangs. So no crashes is really, really, really boring. So I thought, why not change tutorial very, very little? So I changed the tutorial, and instead of parsing PNG files, I parse GIF files. And GIF is also one thing that is um, supported by image IO. So we just change all the strings from PNG to GIF, and we run the exact same tutorial that is on GitHub again. So it's, it's starting up again. It takes a little. And it says, all set and ready to roll. And we get crashes. So this is very weird, isn't it? I mean, this tells us two things. One thing is, it's still very easy to find bugs in Java with fuzzers. And the second thing it, it tells us it is that JQF was on, on GitHub for two years already, two years. And nobody bothered to take the tutorial, change it slightly, and get new bugs.
So I just recorded this video um, two weeks ago. This is very, very recent. And I didn't even like submit the bugs yet because they're not security critical. So here's what I found. So crashes, very disappointing at first. So crashes now don't mean that we get the Java process to crash, but we get index out of bounds exceptions and the sorts. So what we can mainly do is find uncaught exceptions. And while this is very important for your software to have robust software, to have less bugs in your software, this is not really a security issue. So we find uncaught exceptions, which are good if you, if you can fix them, but it's not really a security issue. So hopefully your Java process won't crash just because of an uncaught exception. But so we know the red parts are actually just uncaught exceptions, so not that interesting for us. In most cases, it depends on the exception. So, but what are these hangs again? So we, we, we talked about um, that it just takes too long to process one of the input files. So this is much more interesting for the Java case because we, what we can find here is infinite loops in Java libraries. So in the past, uh, in the past I was able to find five different security vulnerabilities in various Java software. So for example, I was able to crash Apache Tika um, by uh, submitting a file and it would just run forever and will be stuck in a loop. And at one point, use up all, um, all memory or all CPU or whatever resource it takes. I found a bug in JUnrar, I found a bug in PDF box for PDF parsing. I found even a bug in Commons Compress, so Apache Commons, very, very popular library. And if you, um, if you parse my zip file that I created with the fuzzer, then that would result in an infinite loop. And even in the standard library of Java, you, I was able to find a bug in the riff reader. Okay. So maybe this was a little bit far away from your daily work you're doing. So let's take all of this a little bit closer to your development life cycle. So some of you might say, well, at our company, our developers, they write unit tests. And unit tests should bring up uncaught exceptions and things like that. And we, we should be able to, to find these things with unit tests. But um, if some, some developers are here, they all know that writing unit tests is not their favorite topic usually. It takes time and you have to come up with ideas how to break your own code or what edge cases there could be. So wouldn't it be nice to have a program that does it automatically for you and is smart as well? So that's why jQuery Zest was developed. And it has the entire smarts we just talked about. So it does the entire AFL approach that we just talked about. But it's a little bit different because it now is able to not only use input streams and not only fuzz methods that uh, take input streams, but also anything else, um, any other argument that has a JUnit quick check generator. It's another project and these generators are able to create um, different types. And there are already a lot of different generators for a lot of different software, uh, sorry, arguments out there. So for the very simple arguments like integer strings and so on, you already have generators and you don't need to do anything else. So this is probably the biggest pro for JQF Zest. You can now not only um, fuzz input stream, but any kind of Java type, really. And otherwise, if it doesn't work, you just have to write your own generator. The second thing is that in a, in a test or in a unit test, if you have um, assume statements, which basically means, okay, this test is only, only makes sense when certain conditions are true from the input, then Zest will be able to understand these assume statements and will try to create input that already um, passes these assume statements. And therefore, this is an addi additional feature. So 
Here, Cest is very smart again and tries to find inputs that really go through your test. And then, and I think that's one of the big things here, um, it's also available as a Maven plugin. So now there's no more need to install any kind of software for fuzzing except Maven. So if you're already building your Java software with Maven, the only thing you have to do is write a little bit of XML and say, okay, please pull down uh, JQF, I wanna do a fuzzing run later on. So this allows really easy integration into your continuous integration platform. So let's look at an example of how JQF SES works. We have again this annotation at fast coming from JQF, but now we have arguments that are a map and a string. So with JQF AFL, we weren't able to test this, but with JQF SES, now we are. We, and we don't have to change the code at all. There's also an assume statement in there. So this test says, okay, I get a map, which maps a string to an integer, and I get a string, and I want to run this test, I want that the string I get, that it's already in that map. That's a precondition, basically. So SES will be able to create inputs to this method that already conform to this assume statement. What we do then is put it into a Patricia try. Now, it's not important for today what a Patricia try is exactly, but it's a data structure. It's very similar to a map, so we put something in and it maps one thing to the other, and if we put something in, then it's in there later on and we can retrieve it again. And then the third thing where test is really good is the assert statement um, that we can do. So before we were only able to find uncaught exceptions and hangs, but now we can also say, okay, if this assert statement is violated, please also notify me and I wanna know. So we can do additional instrumentation basically by using assert statements. So the example I just showed you was Patricia try. And to be honest, I would have never thought that that test would ever turn up anything because it basically means we have a data structure, we put something in there, we put a second thing in there, and well, then both things should be in there, right? But Rohan, who's the creator of JQF, so he's at Berkeley, and he wrote JQF and found a bug by using the example we, should look, we just looked at. And it's marked as uh, critical, it is marked as open and unresolved, and it's in the Apache Commons collection, which is a very, very, very important library for a lot of Java projects. And the, th the thing really is what JQF says found was that if you create a new Patricia try and you put in X as a value, then, well, of course, afterwards, X is in there. So the first assert statement here passes because X is in the data structure after we put it in there. But then, afterwards, if you put in X and a zero byte Unicode character, then afterwards, X is missing in the data structure. So by inserting a value, we are able now to delete the value inside the data structure. And this violates the very fundamental understanding of this data structure for every programmer. So this is a really big thing actually, and they have problems solving this, um, this uh, bug in Apache Commons. And you know, this can be a really bad security vulnerability because data structures are used everywhere. And if uh, an attacker is now able to delete from a data structure when something is inserted, this violates a lot of expectations from Java developers. Okay, let's look quickly at how JQF SEST will look like. This is SEST. Um, it's UI, it's a little bit similar to, to what we saw uh, for AFL, but it looks a little bit different. So we have the method that is tested and we have the elapsed time. So it was running for 47 seconds in this case. And what's also really cool, you can say, please take a time limit. So please only run for five minutes. 
So every time something is checked in into your code on the, on the server, then you can say run the continuous integration and just run it for five minutes to fuzzer and it will find bugs for you. In this case, six bugs were found. Again, this is uncaught exceptions. This is um, assert statement violations and this is hangs. So now it's not called crashes anymore because for Java that's kind of misleading. It's now called failures. And we also get an execution speed and this is pretty crazy. We have an execution speed in this screenshot of 2,200 um, items per second. And you can imagine with the smart approach of knowing when a new code pass is triggered and this speed, we get very, very good and interesting results. So in my experience, JQuest test is very quick, very fast. So for this presentation, I thought, well, Let's pick a random target that is used at a lot of places and fuzz it so I have something to show you. So I decided let's fuzz Bouncy Castle. Bouncy Castle is a cryptographic library and it's installed on all your Android phones. Um, so it's a very fundamental cryptographic library. It's used everywhere. And it has this ASN1 parser. Again, for today, it's not important what it is, but it's a format that is used everywhere. For example, client certificates for TLS are usually, at one point, it's ASN1. So there's a parser for it, and I thought, well, why not run our fuzzer against this bouncy castle ASN1? And let's rerun this test. So we have one simple source file, which looks just like before. We have a add fuzz annotation, and a method that takes a byte array. We pass it to ASN1 input stream. We get out all the objects of the input stream. And again, if we get an IO exception, we just don't care. We say like, okay, this is not a big issue. We don't really need um, IO exceptions. We don't wanna know about them. So, the other thing we have is a pom.xml file. So this is a configuration file for Maven, and we say, okay, we need the JQF plugin, and we need these JUnit quick check generators, and we need JQF fuzz, and of course, we also need Pouncy Castle, but it's only two files you're really writing. If you're already compiling your code with Maven, it's just two files you're, you're writing, and it should be very close to what your developers already do. So, Compiling it or just running it with Maven, you can say, please get down all the dependencies, compile it, and it worked. And then inside Maven, you can just say, please, Maven, run the fuzzer, JQF fuzz. And we have to specify the class that we want to test and the method we want to test. And Maven will hopefully, happily run the fuzzer for us. So this is a little bit fast forward, so we don't have to wait too long. Um, so seconds fly here. But you see, after um, a little bit more than one minute, we already have seven failures inside Bouncy Castle Ace and one parser. So what does this mean? Uh, or what, what kind of bugs was I able to trigger? So I, I found simple bugs, uncaught exceptions, class cast exceptions. So they were, um, casting different Java classes to other classes, and I was able to, to submit this bug, and it was fixed at Bouncy Castle. But then there was one bug, which was, or an uncaught exception as well, which was again really interesting, which was then later on assigned CV 2019-17359, and it's a Java out of memory error. So we were able to trigger with a very short ASN1 input we are able to allocate all the memory that is available inside the Java process and therefore crash Java. This is a security bug because we didn't really evaluate exactly um, how this could be exploited or in which cases we can exploit it already nowadays, but Bouncy Castle also has a TLS stack, so it might be possible that by sending this ASN1 input stream um, as a client certificate in a TLS connection, you can crash the Java server. The real success story about 
fuzzing Bouncy Castle is that as soon as I um, sent them these bugs and showed them as well how easy it is to uh, do fuzzing runs, and I sent them the code, they started to fuzz other areas of Bouncy Castle, and they, for example, now fuzzing the GPG code, and the developers started to use it everywhere. And I'm really happy that we're able to um, actually show it to the, to the people to, who write Java software, and they use it um, on their daily work to improve their software. If it will make it into Android is another question, by the way, because Android is a fork of Bouncy Castle, and they have uh, an older version, and yeah, you know, it's the standard problem of Android. So let's talk a little bit about the future of Java fuzzing. So at the moment, as you can see, we find resource management issues. So we find infinite loops, we find um, out of memory bugs, and these are security bugs, but I would say rather not so interesting security bugs because they can be mainly used for denial of service attacks. So I can bring down a server, but I'm not able to execute code. Now, I think at one point, we might uh, use the Java Security Policy Manager. The Java Security Policy Manager allows us to do additional instrumentation. What we can say is that code should not be able to open a network socket, for example. And that might be important, and it might be even important for your image library. So what we just talked about, image IO, that parses PNG files, and PNG files have metadata in it. And metadata can, has different formats, and one of these formats is XML. And XML can have, uh, can have references to external servers, so it might be that your image parser connects to other servers and uh, downloads XML to parse. So we usually call it server-side request forgery, this kind of um, box. And I hope we can find these kind of box in the future. We're not there yet, but at the moment, it's already very impressive just to see all these denial of service box we can find, and it really doesn't take much takes writing one very simple Java class. And if you already have it, and if you're already writing unit tests, then that's no problem at all. So I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, I hope I was able to animate some of you to uh, tell your developers to start using JQF. It's uh, usually fairly easy. It's even more easy if you're using Maven. And as an IT security researcher, please also start using uh, JQF, memory corruption is not everything in security. And yes, uh, come to the Java world. We have a lot of bugs here. Thank you. Where do we see questions in the room? There's one in the center. Um, you had the idea to um, add it into the CI pipeline. Can you also like uh, check only which parts changed in the code and then just test the new paths? Yeah, of course. I mean, your Maven plugin takes the class and the, uh, and the method that should be tested, right? So basically, which unit test should be run? And uh, I guess uh, your CI platform should have a feature that does that. I mean, there's none in, in the Maven plugin because I, th I don't think it's the responsibility of the Maven plugin. But I think uh, your CI platform should be able to say, okay, only this part of the code was, was changed, so please just run the tests, the unit tests in this, in this area. Yeah, I hope it's possible. Another one? There was one? Yeah, back there. Cool. So thanks for your interesting talk. Uh, speaking about integrating it in the build automation change, uh, do you have any suggestions? Because fuzzing can take like five minutes, it can take an hour, it could be raise a failure after 10 seconds. How, how would you integrate it time-wise to have a continuous integration? It depends on your server. So, I mean, if you have, uh, if you have, uh, 100 CPUs idling, and you can run 100 tests at the <laughs> same time if you want. 
you can run it for months. So I've, I've been running fuzzing runs for maximum one year, which was super crazy. That was just a test. Um, but all these bugs I've just presented were usually found under two minutes. Because it's a new fuzzer, it's very fast, very smart. Uh, it uncovers bugs that are usually not found easily. And it will be very so quick. So no time at all. No time at all. So I think if you start with three minutes and you can spare three minutes for every of your builds, and I mean, you have to run it for every method, right? For every unit test. So I mean, you have to be a little bit smart about it, but I think it's not going to be an issue. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Tobias. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Coming here. Thank you Welcome. Swiss chocolate, not from Liechtenstein. <laughs> <laughs> What for?